Great. Okay, so uh, puns two. Really, the question is uh, for you is, is, what is puns two? Well, hopefully, it's going to be understanding what the public wants from archaeological interventions. This is a project that has been funded by 21CAP, um, and we, the CBA, are delighted to be doing it in collaboration with MOLA. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and give you a very quick overview of what it is, and what we're going to do, and some of the issues and challenges as we go through this. What, what is puns? Well, puns originally was the publication of Archaeological Projects, a user needs survey. It was done in 1998, published in 1999. And yes, this is the long-awaited review of puns. Um, but as you can see, this actually is what puns is. It's just a load of floppy disks that you can't actually use anymore. Uh, that sits behind my desk. Uh, and I took that photograph yesterday. And, and literally, it in a nutshell encapsulates the challenge we've actually got. This is 24 years ago, and it's already effectively entirely out of date in terms of how you can read it. So what we want to do is puns too. But the first really important change is it's not about just publications. It's actually about the public. What do the public really want out of archaeological interventions? Who are the public we might want to be interested in terms of our archaeological interventions? And how do we actually reach them and, and have meaningful conversations with them? So, um, in a nutshell, the aim is to contribute to an evidence-based framework for improving the means by which archaeological information is shared with its audiences. And we're really wanting to broaden and underpin the public value of archaeological interventions by offering a comprehensive and current understanding of audiences, um, uses and appreciation of archaeological outputs. There are four objectives. One, to understand the current practices and, un and advances in communicating archaeological information. So potentially getting away from all of this. Um, to really understanding the audience needs. What do they want? What are they actually looking for? How do they want to consume what it is we're all actually producing and doing? We also want to do much more in-depth horizon scanning for the future. And, and, and this will absolutely start to set and train the ability to redo this survey more frequently. Because actually, you can't wait 24 years. Otherwise, your first survey, you, the actions are just not being done. So again, that's really important. And again, we'll be making reference to Historic England's Digital Transformation Survey in that. And then we want to arrive at a set of recommendations for the future development of guidance. Uh, and that's going to be for everybody, whether that's professional, voluntary organizations, commercial archaeologists, or archaeological communicators. So we want to get away from this, this, this hard paper stuff. Uh, and, and we want it to be really meaningful, which actually includes finding a better title than puns, because quite frankly, it's pants. Um, and I love finding this. This was, this was what they were thinking of in 1999 uh, as a working title for puns, Published and Be Damned. Uh, uh, and if anyone wants to guess whose that handwriting is, you can come to me later and I'll tell you if you're right or not. Um, but again, it's really important. This is about the public and how we actually make this public facing. And in many ways, that actually led us to a natural collaboration um, with MOLA, and in particular, Sarah Perry's team at MOLA, which obviously you know, includes Sadie Watson, and looking at her work around the public benefit of archaeology, because that's, in essence, what this is about. So again, I'm really delighted that we actually have um, collaborated with MOLA in putting this together. And I'd like to ask Guy to give, give the contractor's perspective. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, so I am here representing my wonderful colleague, Sarah Perry. Um, so I'm going to apologize in advance for all the errors which my, my version of this presentation will contain. And all the credit is with Sarah and her um, brilliant team. Um, why I'm excited to be involved in a project like this, I think that um, for MOLA, we sort of sit at that junction between commercial archaeology, research and engagement. Um, Sarah's official job title is Director of Research and Engagement. And so a uh, project like this is all about doing rigorous research into what, who our audiences are, what they want, and how we can, be, how we can um, be impactful to them. So this is all about thinking about the impact that MOLA can have. 
And I think that's something that's going to be a really big topic for us going forward over the next few years. So the puns two is quite in quite an early stage. So we're in the sort of baseline um, data gathering moment, as it were. And um, what Sarah really wanted to, to really talk about here um, is that there is an awful lot of literature. She says oodles, oodles of writings around this topic. Um, and a lot of this is highlighting the failings of those of us, and I think that this means us, including us contractors, um, who curate the historic environment, um, that we've failed in a way to, to encourage a true sustained participation from different and diverse groups within the UK population. And I think it's a given, and Sarah says that it's a given, that, that a lot of us already probably understand what that what those failings are about. But um, to take an example here, this is a CBA report um, containing lots of um, very useful data and statistics uh, that indicate the demographic failings, as it were, um, and indicate how we tend to um, I, we tend to be impacting on quite a narrow demographic. Um, and and the, the upshot of that is that that then has an impact on the way that we talk about the past and the way that we do our work. And actually, the demographic um, in connection with us forms a kind of a, um, a circular arrangement where we speak to the same people and therefore they, they, they tell us what they want and it's the same thing. And therefore, we, we create a, an endless cycle where we don't um, actually break out into the wider um, range of audiences that are possible. So early days work on this then is that, as Sarah says, it, to make matters worse, as Sarah says, but I don't think that she means um, quite in this way. The work that we've been doing with the audience, um, the audience network, what, uh, uh, which is an NH, NHLF funded project, and it involves lots of people who are already in the room, um, and the project is winding up this year. But the takeaway uh, point from this, which Sarah really wanted to, to put over, is that we actually don't have detailed data. So in the previous slide, we could, we could identify that we've got these very broad demographic kinds of um, data available to us. But what we don't have is really detailed data um, around the really specific needs of particular audiences. And she describes this as, um, temporary and situational needs. And that is the idea that, for example, um, somebody that has kids would struggle to attend an all-day event because they would need to go and pick up their kids later. So that might create an access problem for them. And those are the really specific, tiny little bits of um, user needs, which we're not fully understanding yet. And we haven't really collected data about that. So with that kind of piecemeal data, those types of things have a big impact on who can and can't access archaeological programs, be, them, be they professional or, um, uh, I don't know, what, what would be the opposite of that? Would be pro professional in the sense of joining us to work for us, but also thinking about our audiences that we might want to speak to um, through our engagement activities. Um, and the... Sarah wants to emphasize that it's really important that we go out and listen to people and use our conversational skills um, so that we can actually take um, that conversation to go beyond a kind of generic learning or a kind of broadcast type of response. And we really want to try and also record people's emotional responses. So enjoyment, sure, uh, but also going beyond that to try and understand people's sense of presence or other types of measurements which we could take into consideration, things like um, what is the carbon footprint of an activity that we're doing. So those are, those are findings which are coming out of the Archaeology Audience Network work which is happening now and are going to be very much fed into the PUNS2 project. And as Neil was saying, we, all of the people that are involved here and everyone else in the room, we want to continue this conversation through into the next part of the work. And then finally, this is a little bit about what 
the about what Sarah has kind of created within Mola. So her her remit um, as director of research and engagement is relatively new. So it's it's a way that it was a way a few years ago that we found in Mola to foreground this type of work to put it on a par with the other commercial activities that we're doing. And Sarah came into MOLA having spent her academic career um, trying to study the sort of gaps in the understanding of audiences that we have and gaps in the offering that we have to different audiences. And I actually think that what Sarah's been doing is building a kind of infrastructure within MOLA for doing the research that we need to do um, and to build an infrastructure for creating a kind of equitable participation in, in archaeology. Um, and I just wanted to basically give you an idea of some of the themes which Sarah is putting front and center in our work. Um, the idea of redistribution. And this is thinking about that academically in terms of redistribution of, of power. So it's not just us standing up the front here telling people about things, but take um, redistributing that power. And interestingly, I think this is a really interesting point that Sarah makes. It's also about it distributing wealth. So actually, when you do ask people to participate in things, can you, should you pay them to be there? Um, we, want other, we want to um, enable people to reclaim control over the spaces and the histories that have been taken from them. And this is an idea that this is easy to think of in a paradigm where, where we would go out into, a, an, into another country, claim objects, and bring them back to our museum. But if you think about it, that is also what we're doing as commercial archaeologists. We're very often going into people's communities, digging up stuff, taking it away, putting it on a shelf. And as the previous speakers would say, not always doing a good, good job of putting it on the shelf and making it available to them, even in the most basic way. So actually, this is about saying, this stuff does belong to communities. The stories that come out of it belong to the communities. And can we help people to reclaim that? And then finally, we, we want to talk about creating um, a support and a way, um, creating spaces where people can actually be comfortable coming to our activities and working with us. Um, we need to work really hard to change the way that we frame our activities to make it so that the things we do are easier for people to access. And that will help us to much more widely be impactful. So that's my bit done, and back over to Neil. Thank you. Okay, so what you get there is the, the, the depth of thinking that we're putting in around this, but um, what I want to do now is just do two, two things, is just explain some of the issues and opportunities building on what Guy has said, but also look at how we're gonna try and approach the audience's question in this, because there's a lot of learning in that for all of us. What I'm going to do with the issues and opportunities, I'm actually going to do what I've been experiencing in the three years I've now been at the CBA. So these are the, these are the direct challenges that are happening to the CBA right now. So the first one's about publication. Okay, so I have a deeply challenging situation with British archaeology. Um, my distributors will say, paper copies on a magazine shelf, I have to plan for a minimum of a 5% decrease in sales every year. When I say, how long then? Um, they don't see potentially digital um, paper versions of magazines beyond five years. What are we going to do with it? I can't lose British archaeology, but I've got to totally reimagine it. OK, fantastic. Let's go digital. OK, well, when I um, first worked for the CBA back in 1996, um, we just about had a website and we had lots of paper. Now we have a website. Well, we actually have two websites. We have a um, TikTok channel, a YouTube channel. We have an Instagram account. We have a LinkedIn account. We have a um, Twitter account. And these accounts are growing. I don't have any more staff to manage all those. And I can tell you now, every single one of those platforms, including our Facebook page, has a different audience. They have a different requirement for what you put on there. Uh, nobody in my team is young enough for TikTok anymore. So our, our TikTok just sits there, right? This is really serious stuff. We've got to get a grip. What does this actually mean for us? So that's digital transformation. What's it really going to mean? What is my membership going to want in the future? But what's also very interesting is about audiences, because my membership is, the membership of the CBA is fundamentally going to change in the next 10 years, fundamentally. Why? 
Well, if I look at my demographics, unfortunately, I probably have to accept most of them won't be alive. OK, uh, what, who are going to be my members? Are they going to want to get a paper magazine? Are they want to going to get a membership card? No, probably not. Now, to put this really starkly, there are about between five and 7,000 people who directly engage through membership, subscription, or the Young Archaeologists Club, OK, with, with the CBA. That grows out when we look at the network of groups and archaeological societies to about 9,000 people in this country who are sort of paid up members of the archaeological club. You add in another 6,000 undergraduate and postgraduate students, and you add in the 7,000 employed people in archaeology. That is about 25,000 people, or less than one third of 1% of the population of this country. All right? They are the committed. They're engaging deeply. But we now know from the Festival of Archaeology that our engagement levels are completely different. The digital reach of the hashtag Festival of Archaeology last year in June, July, and August was 84.7 million. What is going on there? Well, I find it really interesting because I don't think people are engaging very really deeply. What they do is they love to watch archaeology. What are we going to do to change the watchers into more committed people who engage with us? Because I think this is a matter for all of us. Because we don't have an army of people out there who will come and fight for our survival. We have lots of people who will watch and just consume. How do we really strengthen that work? And in essence, some of the stuff we need to look at in puns is how that's going to work. Now, we've been doing some work with Historic England, who have just produced this new piece of work about um, audiences in focus, and they've created a number of um, audience segmentation pen portraits. They published this last week, which I'm delighted they did. But obviously, having formerly worked in Historic England, I knew they were doing it several years ago. So we've actually been working with Historic England to look at how we might use this. How might this help our conversation? They identify um, seven, seven different audience segments. OK, so our first response was, there's no way I can talk to seven different types of audience. I just don't have the resources to do that. So what we did is we tried to think about how could we group them up a little bit and what do they mean for archaeology? And we have, for the CBA and the purpose of some of our communication, created three audiences. The first lot we call known to archaeology. Now, interestingly, when you put all the Historic England statistics together, th this lot amounts to about 30% of the UK population. But 49% of heritage professionals are in these three groups. I can go into more detail if you want me to come back and talk about them in detail. But it's really interesting. These, these are the producers. But this is probably where the 25,000 of us actually sit. Yeah. So we're not even reaching all of that potential audience. The second one is new to archaeology. Who are these? Well, they're, they're again about 27% of the population. 45% um, of people work in heritage. Uh, if you work in heritage, you're, you're in this, this, this sort of broad bracket of, of different groups. And these are the people who probably like going to heritage attractions. They love going to the National Trust, and they'll engage with archaeology by chance. Yeah? So they'll go to, say, a National Trust property, and there's an event during the Festival of Archaeology. So it makes work, the festival really important about how we actually focus it. It's a vast audience, but they won't engage if you say archaeology. They'll engage if they say, oh, there's a hole in the ground, and there's something for them to actually do. And then the last group, which is the really interesting one we're calling Archaeology Why Me. This relates to just one of the Historic England pen portraits. They call it the blue group. And this group is young, highly diverse, and very urban. And when this was explained to me, I was actually told, this is the group who don't like heritage. This is the group who are the hardest for us to reach. Our challenge straight back was, no, this group don't like your version of heritage. They're deeply engaged in heritage, but they define it in a very, very different way. You cannot expect them to come to us. We have to go to them and change our way of communication. Exactly some of the stuff Guy was talking about and what um, Sarah's actually been looking at. We need to redistribute our power by going and giving it up and getting them to do the talking. But they're a third of the population, and they are the young element of the population. And I can tell you now, we don't know how to talk to them at all. I, I know my daughter turned 18 this week, and she's just finished school. So, yep, uh, she's still not told me she's alive after her prom last night. Um, so I'm clearly doing something wrong. 
But what's really important in that is we can, we can build on those audiences and we can understand them and we can then work out how we'll go and communicate with them. But we've also got to filter this work back through um, our existing world we actually split up. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to actually make sure that any of the engagement we do is specifically tailored for how we work with professional commercial archaeologists, how we work within the academic field, how we, how we work and talk to that, that very committed voluntary element uh, that we can identify through the existing groups they're in. But then we actually need to look at this wider non-specialist um, group of public. And again, through the work that we've actually um, been engaged with with MOLA, some of that will actually be um, uh, incentivized. So it'll have an element of reimbursement for people's time because that's what we need to do to actually get them in the conversation. It means doing things at different times in the day. And again, this directly impacts how we operate as a charity and what it means for our public benefit. So now my trustees meetings, um, uh, when they happen, they never happen concurrently at the same time during the day. They are now staggered. Why? Because in my last round of trustees, I managed to get three uh, people who are, are parents to young children. So they actually can't meet between 5 and 6 p.m. because that's when they're trying to put their children to bed. Yeah. And at the same time, they can't always meet in the middle of the afternoon for four hours because they've got jobs. And this becomes really important about how we reimagine this voluntary focus and groups. And I have to be really clear why we need to think about that challenge. Because the challenge with the CBA and our membership growing older is, is replicated amongst archaeological groups and societies. And actually, we've got to work out what we want that sector to represent and be in the future and how we actually potentially support them. So there's some really big issues there and actually what this piece of work will start to unlock. Because you are the producers. You need to know your audience and what they're actually wanting to consume. Because ultimately, that is the public benefit. That's where it's made real and made live. And simply, that's what we're going to try and do over the next two years. Thank you.